Good evening, everyone. So I'm a computational linguist. Uh, I'm not sure what happens if you ask a computer uh, to get a black hole cocktail, but nothing very good, I think. Um, and I'm going to tell you about my research tonight. My research goal is to build a computational models that capture what we as humans understand from language. And what do we understand? Much more than the literal meaning of strings. Indeed, when we communicate, there is a lot that is not said explicitly, but rather inferred. And so if uh, my son, you know, 12 year old, is going out with some friends and he's asking me, can I have 10 euros? And I reply, my bag is in the living room next to the sofa. What do you think he's going to understand? Can he get 10 euros? Yes, yes probably, right? But did I say that explicitly? No, but we all get it, right? And now when you think about you know, how you communicate your, your, with your friend, you are going to see that you know, this is what we do every day, all the time. Not say stuff totally explicitly, but we do get it. And so linguists have long you know, looked at this, and so here, at some point, Google wanted to do uh, follow-up queries, that you could query something and then continue like you were dialoguing with the, the computer. And so if you ask romantic movies and then one staring Emma Watson, what does one mean here? Movies or romantic movies? And that, that's actually a question that people still debate. It's not totally clear, right? It could be both, right? And this is a phenomenon that linguists have been studying that's called sense anaphora. What exactly does one mean here? Highest grossing film this year, who are the actors? Again, what do we understand when I say who are the actors? It's the actor of the film, okay? Again, another kind of phenomena that linguists are studying. And we do that just really naturally and very early on uh, when we emerge to language. Is ghost kid friendly and beauty and the beast? What do actually do we mean there and beauty and the beast? Is it kid friendly, right? And you get it this immediately and kids get that too very early on. And this is what we call ellipsis. Actually, we don't say kid friendly, but we infer it from the, the context. And so what we are going to focus on tonight is uh, my, my research, actually, where I look at something else that we do every day. When you are faced with language, you read the newspaper or you are listening to the radio, you are actually debating when you listen to something or read it whether the events you are um, reading or hearing about are really factual, okay? Let's put aside the um, credibility of the source. We are going to right now live in a world where we can believe the speaker or the, um, the writer, okay? If you read, helicopters are flying over northern New York today, and I guess now we could say something, you know, in Florida, trying to locate people stranded with food, heat, or medicine, you decide for each event that's in the sentence whether it is a fact or not. And so you are going to probably evaluate that flying is true. They are trying, hopefully, right, to locate that we don't know whether they've already located people or not. And probably if we are sending a helicopter, there are people stranded uh, out there without food, heat, or medicine, right? And this is something we do just, you know, effortlessly. And what I'm trying to do is to get model computers to do that, okay? You present the computer a piece of text and it's going to tell you whether the event should be true um, or not, okay? So let's take another sentence slightly more complex here. I don't believe that people should be allowed to carry guns in their vehicle. There we are going to infer that the speaker don't think, right, people should not be allowed to carry gun in their vehicles. So it is not that when you have text like this, you can just extract, extract pieces of it and take it to be a fact, okay? And we want to, do to get computer to do this. So let me just um, very quickly uh, walk you through the um, history of natural language processing, NLP for natural language processing. So as you probably know, it started in the, in the 50s during the Cold War, primarily with machine translation, trying to, to translate. And actually the first progress that they made was in English and French because of the um, Canadian um, parliament um, parallel data that existed. Okay, and at the beginning, 
we had rules. People, linguists, would sit down and write rules, okay, to translate, to do different stuff. And one of the first program that existed that people knew about is called ELISA, and it was mimicking um, a psychotherapist, okay, a Rogerian one, where uh, often in that technique, the, the patient is talking, and then the, um, the therapist is saying back in a question what the, the patient is saying. And so you can easily, actually, especially in English, because English has a, you know, very relative to other languages, poor uh, syntax, no offense to, you know, native English speaker uh, out there, as well as a poor morphology, especially if you are trying to learn French, especially write it, you know that it is a bit trickier than, than English. And so we could do that actually fairly well, okay, just with rules. Um, and so you have like those ELISA program, and now there are still, you know, some big companies, tech companies that have competition. Um, you, you try to write the best ELISA program, and we have to see whether, you know, people do it uh, well long enough. Then we had this other first natural language understanding program that's called uh, Shurdlu. That's coming actually from the linotype machine. Um, the, um, it was Etoin Shurdlu, which is the frequency of the English uh, letters, uh, the, the, first, the most frequent one first. Um, that's where the name comes from. This has been invented by um, Terry Winograd at MIT at the end of the 60s, where you had a very small block world that the user could interact with a computer to do stuff. And so it could, you could really, it was not um, oral, you had to type, but you could say, pick up a red blog, and it would pick a red blog, and then you had to say, the computer would ask, what do I do? Put it over a green square, and it would put it there. If they were like, or put it on the green square, and there would be several green squares. There were rules explicitly written saying the computer would say, like, which green square do you mean? Because it would not know when you say the, there should be only one, right? So that was, you know, 70s. And then um, we had, like, grammar that people could also write rules and be able to parse, you know, say what is the structure of the sentence. And that was what we call the symbolic era. Okay, and then, you know, computers have more memory, we can process much more text, and we do get corpus, so sets of text that are uh, put together and that computers can read. We also have like tree banks where we have like more linguistic annotation that exists, and so we can do stuff with statistic at that point, okay, and so now, we will not have rule-based parsing, but statistical parsing. How often do we see some construction in the text, okay? Um, and so just like for, this was a PhD, uh, the, um, uh, an image for a PhD dissertation on, on uh, Farsi, Persian language. And I think it's a beautiful drawing of a tree, for tree bank, okay, with the, the Farsi language. And now, uh, nowadays, since the 2000, 2015, we are in what we call the neural era. And you've probably all uh, heard about um, neural networks, those very complicated um, computer systems that exist uh, nowadays. Started with vision, got really like extremely good performance in vision, and then other fields starting, started to use um, those techniques. And we can do it because we have like lots of data nowadays with, you know, the web starting in 2000, and you know that, you know, I mean, there is text everywhere all the time. And so all the system that has been developed in computational linguistic, are, those are the names, maybe you've heard some of those, Burr, Roberta, the Berta, Grover, and so the inside joke in NLP is that those are the Muppets model because they have names from the, the Muppet show. Okay. Uh, Chris Manning um, was my advisor, and in 2015, he said that our field was really taken by the deep learning, those neural techniques uh, machine, tsunami. And now this is what we are often using, um, but sometimes for linguists it's a little bit difficult because those machines, no one really understands what they are doing, those techniques. Okay? It's a bit of a black box, and so we are trying to see you know, what are they um, doing. And the big, big question actually is what comes next? Okay, and I don't have 
an answer to that question, but the beginning um, of an answer. So what do we do? Um, we want to construct uh, system techniques, right, that are going to understand language as we do it. How do we evaluate those um, techniques? And so people build benchmark, okay? And one of the um, benchmark that we are using right now is called Superglue, developed by people uh, at, uh, in New York, at NYU. And it consists of different tasks that are supposed to see whether a machine understand language, okay? I don't really like to say that the machine understand because I don't think it understand anything, okay? But capture meaning. Um, and so there are different tasks, one that we call natural language inference, question answering, word sense disambiguation, and coreference. Let me illustrate each of those in turn. So inference, you would get the system two pieces of text, one that we are going to call the premise, See, Dana Reeve, the widow of the actor Crystal Reeve, has died of lung cancer at age 44. And then you give a hypothesis. Christopher Reeve had an accident, and the machine has to tell you, is the hypothesis true, given the premise? Okay? That's the task. So here, what would you see? No. Okay. And the computer now, they, they, they are getting good at this. Okay? So you have to see whether it's true, entailment, neutral, we don't know, or false. Okay, contradiction. Question answering, the, what they have here is something like this. You have this sentence, my body cast a shadow over the grass, and then you have to say what could be the cause. And you have two hypotheses, the sun was rising, the grass was cut. To try to see whether there is some world knowledge there. Which one do you think is the right one? The sun was rising. Um, word sense disambiguation, um, you would have two sentences with the same words, um, men of, you know, uh, with morphology not taken into account. Room and board, he nailed boards across the windows, and the system has to say whether those are the same words in terms of meaning. Okay? Are those the same words in terms of meaning? No. And then coreference, this is again something we do all the time. Mark told Pete many lies about himself, which Pete included in his book. He should have been more careful. And then you have to decide, is he Pete? Yes or no? Yeah, Pete, and I, I actually did this, when I was going back to my, to my talk, I was like, this is one that's debatable, I think. Here in the annotation, more people said no, that it was Mark. Um, but I think, you know, it could be both, right? It could be both. Okay, and so like 20 months ago, if you were looking at the Microsoft uh, website, you would read this. Microsoft, the Berta, so one of those neural net uh, system, surpasses human performance on the superglue benchmark. Okay, and indeed, if you look at the results, here is a macro average of the different tasks. Um, they ask humans to redo the task like I did, right? Google Brain was slightly less good than them. I mean, that's not statistically significant, but anyway, they said, you know, um, Microsoft is better than humans for this. So, is the problem automatic language understanding solved? Yes or no? As a linguist, I'm like, what are those 10% that we still cannot do, right? And, you know, most of those think, okay, maybe uh, humans are not that good, it seems, on the surface, but if you really look at the data, which linguists love to do, okay, the computer is actually much better than the humans, only in the case where there is lots of text, okay? And, you know, how are we doing this? Uh, asking students to take, you know, some stuff for credits, right? I'm not sure how much they pay attention, or you pay crowdsourced people out there, but again, right, it's not clear how much they, they pay attention. If you look, for example, at the task of um, work sense disambiguation, humans are extremely good. Okay, coreference also. And machines are not that good. So what I wanted to look at is this problem of factuality that I mentioned at the beginning, when you are faced with a piece of text, do you, um, how do you evaluate whether the the event is true or false, okay? And I did that with um, BERT, one of those systems, which if you want to know what it stands for, it's here, bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. I'm not going to try to explain to you how those machines work, okay? 
Uh, I'm just going to show you the results, and then we are going to analyze those results uh, together. And why can we ask that question? Because we have tons of text nowadays that are annotated for factuality. One of the problems of those machines, those neural nets, is they are really data hungry. And that's a problem, so the idea is that it's some kind of neurons, a bit like our, like our, our brain function, but the problem is that right now, the system that exists out there, they are trained with millions of data, something that you would not be able to read in a lifetime, even if you get to 100 years old, right? So it's, we cannot really say that they are learning like we do right now. Um, so we have those different texts uh, here that exist. I will show you the data size in a minute. Um, and we ask people, I mean, when I say we, others also, right, um, ask people to annotate the, the events in those texts between a scale, a continuous scale, from plus three if it's true to minus three if it's false, okay? So for the rest of the talk, we are going to have that in mind. I'm going to show you scores of factuality that will range from plus three true to minus three false. And what the um, data set on the right have um, in common is that they focus on what we call embedded event. So you have a main verb and then some other verb under that verb, okay? Embedding, you've probably done that in a syntax when you were a little kid, right? What's the complement of a given verb? I say that uh, it's too bright here, for instance, right? It's too bright is the complement of I say that. Okay, so you are still with me right now? Okay, so, um, and here is one of the data sets that I, I constructed with some of the students, and as linguists, we wanted to kind of have some stuff that is slightly tricky for the machine. Okay, so we are going to have some context, and each of the items that the computer is going to see is some event that we want to assess the factuality of, embedded under a verb, okay, that's always going to be bold, bolded in my slides. The stuff that we want to assess the factuality of is going to be underlined, and it's going to be in, um, under a negation, a question, okay, some um, some other linguistic stuff, if you want, okay? So if you read this, at the heart of the universe, there is cruelty. We are predators and are preyed upon every living thing. It's a bit sad. Did you know that wasps lay their eggs in ladybird, piercing the weak spot in their armor? People have to evaluate the factuality of that on this scale from plus three to minus three, and all the annotators said, like, this is true, okay? Even though it's under a question. And so this is something that um, linguists have long, you know, studied. If I say Judith knows that Marie is in Brussels, you are going to get this compliment, Marie is in Brussels, to be true, okay? If I put that in a question, does Judith know that Marie is in Brussels, you still evaluate Marie is in Brussels to be true, right? If I put that in a negation also, Ju Judith doesn't know that Marie is in Brussels, we still get Marie is in Brussels to be true. And so, yeah, you see uh, linguists have looked at that. You know, the first one, looking at those kind of verbs, called them uh, factive because they, you can infer the truth of the content of their complement, and that was Laurie Cartunen, who is a, a very well-known uh, linguist. Now, if I change verb and I use believe, the behavior is going to be different. Judith believes that Marie is in Brussels, then we don't know, right? You can believe true or false thing. Maybe I'm not in Brussels. Does Judith believe that Marie is in Brussels? Again, we still don't know, okay? And those are going to be verb that we say are non-factive, okay? And so linguists have categorized those verbs, and so there is a lot of what is going on in factuality that is lexically triggered, okay? That depends on the kind of word around the event. But then, of course, the Context always plays a role. Okay, language is actually very tricky, as hopefully you know you will be convinced of after this talk. So if I say Annabel could hardly believe that she had a daughter about to go to university, how we evaluate this? Do you think Annabel has a daughter about to go to university? 
Yes, right? But I just told you that believe, you can believe false or true things, right? But here we have like strong, strong intuition that this is going to be true, okay? And so context does some things to that categorization from the 70s, okay? And so here, yeah, most people said this is an average of 10 annotation, and you see most people said two or three, and so the average was something around, it was more than, than 10 annotation actually, otherwise it would be another number. Um, this, this was the, the example that I showed you before. I don't believe that people should be allowed to carry guns in their vehicle. Here we have a strong intuition that um, people should not carry gun, right? And so a, a negative score. And so this, those kind of behavior, at least, you know, the, the, um, the thing I was telling you about know and believe has been uh, codified into this framework that's called implicative signature. It looks complex, but it's not that complex. It's, you know, following our intuition. And so if I say the man managed to stay on his horse, we have intuition about whether the man stayed on the horse or not. Most people are going to say, yes, it stayed, right? But there, now if I negate this and I say the man did not manage to stay, then the man did not stay, right? Because of the meaning of, of manage. And so just focusing on the, um, the verb, we can decide about the factuality of the complement. Okay, and so th this has been like back in the days that was started by Laurie Cartonen in the 70s, where I told you we were writing rules. And so we can write rules about the behavior of the complement. And so this is what we have, okay, and that we can use in a system, okay. And so people did, did that, okay. So just, you know, if you read some of the paper after that, so that you see the, um, the formalism, we are going to then give a signature that's going to be what do we take the complement to be in a positive environment? And here we are going to say manage is plus, a fact. And what about a negative environment? And manage here in a negative environment is not a fact. Okay, so minus. Believe, uh, uh, sorry, no first. It was like in both environments, we are going to still take the complement to be true. Okay, plus, plus. And belief, we don't know, right? You can believe true thing or false thing. This is like abstracting away from context, yeah? But then we can look at, okay, what's happening in, for real, right? Now that we have access to tons of text, do verb actually follow those signatures that have been proposed in the literature, right? And so this is what we had done here, where I did this as a very coarse grain. I average, you know, different example containing the verb Forget, for instance, learn, notice, etc. Um, so this is this is a bit coarse grain. But if the implicative signature thing was totally true, right? Context didn't matter. All the verbs that, that are supposed to be factive should be at the right of the screen and very high. Okay, getting a plus three annotation. And you see that so those those verbs in that um, framework are in orange, and you see that they tend to be on the right, but they are not totally at the top, okay? So then we try to see what was happening in another corpus where they abstracted away from context, okay? Because maybe this can be explained by the context, as I show you example, you know, the Annabelle having a daughter to go to university and things like that, okay? And so there was this other corpus built in um, 2018, by Aaron White and colleague, where they, they ask people to judge events, underline here, of sentences that really look like this, that are semantically bleach. Okay, the only thing that has some content, um, semantic content, is this embedding verb. Okay, so a particular person didn't decline to do a particular thing, and you have to say, is this is do true, false, or we don't know. Okay, and so the hope there was to kind of remove what is happening with context and see our linguist right with that categorization. Okay, um, so decline, if you look at its signature in the, in the list from Laurie Cartonen, is supposed to be minus that if you decline to do something, you didn't do it, but the judgment of people didn't totally agree with that. You see that it's slightly positive. But then we can kind of think, okay, uh, let's, let's look at what's happening overall in all the examples. 
And don't be scared by this graph. I will explain it to you. So you see that you have the different verb signature. Um, and what we did here is to, to fit a, a model that is going to predict the expected category specified by the verb uh, signature uh, from the mean of the human annotation. And so if the signature were totally right, if the data was going the way you know, linguists had predicted, we should have all the dots at the top each time. Okay? And you see that it tends to be like that, but not always. Okay? But the idea is that, so linguists are not totally right, but they tend to be right, okay? And maybe machines, if we give them enough text, they are going to learn what's in the text, okay? Because those neural nets, um, being function approximators, they should really, really be good at extracting stuff that's in the annotation, okay? And so what we do there, it's something that's called supervised learning. You give data with annotation and the machine learns, um, and then try to predict, okay? And so our hypothesis was that BERT is going to be extremely good when it kind of goes more like linguists had predicted, okay? Or at least like it is in the data, because at the end of the day, that's what it's doing, learning from the data. But as soon as you have like some context, like the Annabelle example, that's going to go against most of the other frequent example in the data, it's going to miserably fail, okay? Where a human would not, okay? Does that make sense? Good. So I did that with uh, one of my PhD uh, students who is uh, still in the US. And so I had promised you that I would show you the, um, the size of those corpus. And you see that it is learning on relatively, you know, big amount of, of data. And what we do is that you have those systems that are those neural nets that are trained on English language, okay? Then you can give it um, the task that you want it to perform on and still even give it a little bit more data of your particular corpus that you are looking at. That's what we call fine tuning. And so for instance, for the commitment bank uh, data at the top, we give it only 250 items, okay? 250 items. And you know, it can kind of learn from this on top of everything that it has learned, okay? Um, and so, uh, usually you train, so you fine tune on this training, you want to look how it does on the development set, okay, and then really on the test, but you don't uh, allow test item to be part of the training data, of course, right? This is why there are three columns in that table. And if we look at the results, so how we evaluate this is looking at correlation. So one is maximum, okay? And you can see that it does extremely well on, on most of the, of the data. I don't know what that number is bolded here. That's a, a mistake. I was comparing with something else in another talk and I didn't remove it, okay? But still, you know, okay, in the 90, but it's not perfect, okay? But so if we look at here, let's just focus, I'm going to focus on the, this commitment bank and the mega radicality that I talked about. So you see that BERT fine-tune on a little bit of data, 250 does fairly well, okay? But we can compare to um, other models that exist out there, like a rule-based model where you give those implicative signature, and it's really rule-based, right? So given this uh, signature, what would you predict? It does 50, okay. Um, in 2018, Rachel Runninger tried to have other systems which are by LSTM, uh, slightly different configuration. I'm not going to enter into detail here. And you see that it didn't do that well. But if we actually use BERT, the, the, this neural net, only on the same four data set that Runninger and the RET was using, it's not doing that much better than the rule-based system, right? Which is a bit of a problem when, you know, Microsoft wants to say that their system is beating humans. It is only doing very well if you allow it to see a little bit of the data that you are testing it on. But it's not that you can always make, you know, them see all of the data that we are testing them on. So we looked at whether that was happening for mega radicality. Same thing, right? If you let it see a little bit of mega radicality, it does very well, 85. 
But if it doesn't see, it actually does the same as that uh, by LSTM model. So a little bit less, um, less nice, okay? And so then we, we looked, um, just for the more technical people out there, whether our hypothesis was correct. We looked qualitatively, I'm going to show you an example in a minute, as well as quantitatively. And so what we did is a linear mixed effect model using the absolute error between this expected inference according to the, the signature and the label to predict the absolute error of the model prediction with random intercept and slope for each data set. So big table with number, but the only thing that's important is to see here that the coefficient for the random slope are positive, which then corroborates our um, um, hypothesis. But so let's look at data. So what, gets, what does the model get wrong, okay? So here is an example. Um, and I think society for such a long time said, well, you know, we are married, now you need to have your family. And I don't think it's been until recently that they had decided that two people was a family, where then people judge that as relatively positive, okay, a fact. Another example, I've myself devised many staff plans over the years, and I do not believe I'm being unduly boastful if I say that very few ever needed amendment. Even more facts, right, that apparently very few of the plans devised by that person needed amendment, okay? But what does the system predict? Highly negative. And why? Because it learned that when they were construction like this I don't think or I don't believe, remember that example that I sh showed you at the beginning, beginning, I don't believe that people should carry gun in their vehicle, often, I don't believe blah, 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 means I believe that not blah, 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 okay? And this is also a construction that linguists have long studied, okay? But, and, and you often have that in text, and that's what the system learned, okay? That often, if he sees something like I don't think, I do not believe, and see that in the second ex example, this I do not believe is even not the verb that embeds the complement, okay? But still, very strong indication of something being negative, and that's what then the system see. Okay. Um, another factor that I didn't talk about but that exists is the interaction with tense. I kind of you know sketch it a little bit um, too um, easily. It's not only verb like that. It's a certain tense of a verb that then has some inference about the factuality of the complement, okay? And so, something like this. She had meant to warn Mr. Brown about tuppence. We have strong intuition that she did not, okay? And this is what the gold annotation is, so annotation by the human, but the system cannot predict that, okay? A bigger contribution means to support candidate Y. Gold annotation is like, we don't know. Are we supporting the candidate or not? But then, then the system is actually saying, like, yeah, probably yes, a, a 1.5 almost. Okay? And so that's where, you know, link, if, if you are actually using rules, the system would do better. Okay? Um, and of course, you know, BERT is not learning any word knowledge. So an example here. And he banged the door shut with the violence of someone who had not learned that car doors do not need the same sort of treatment as those of railway carriages. People say, okay, car doors are not the same as the one of railway carriages, but the system is unable to do that um, correctly. Another one here. Rocco did not write that Mexico, Mexico was a useless country that should be invaded and turned over to Club Med. Strong intuition that it is not true, right? Mexico should not be uh, turned into, over to Club Med, but the system is not able to do it, okay? <clears throat> Other um, thing where context matters. Um, so most of the time, actually, in the annotation, choose was followed by something that could be true or false. We, we, we didn't know. But here, when Hillary Clinton does not choose to stay at Trump Tower, she probably didn't stay at Trump Tower, right? Given what we know about the world. Um, and here, so who is the, the one choosing matters, right? 
compared to that other example, he did not choose to be buried there. You know, the subject here of the choosing is probably already dead, and so we don't know if, whether he chose it or not. Okay? Does that make sense? So a lot of examples where we would not get those wrong, right? We would do those totally right. Um, even though those neural nets are built on tons of data, didn't learn anything. Maybe I, I need to actually check the time of the data that worked. So maybe he didn't see enough about Hillary and Trump yet to, to be able to learn this, and he could with more data. Because um, the thing is that, you know, I showed you it get to 90 correlation of 0.9, right? And this is a tricky task. It's from plus 3 to minus 3 that we are asking the system to, to give an answer. And so sometimes, you know, the answer is 251, and it gives something very, very close to that, right? So it's not, it's not that it's totally failing, right? It does things really, really well, but others still not. And at least for linguists, I think that's maybe where, you know, sometimes we differ when we work in computational linguistics, it's a group of linguists as well as computer scientists. Computer scientists really like the numbers, and the linguists maybe like the data a little bit more, and then we would tell them, yeah, but what about those 10%, right? I really want those 10% to be right. So, wrapping up, um, Hopefully, I convince you that factuality, even though this is something you do every morning, probably listening to the radio or reading your newspaper or looking at your phone, is a complex phenomena that matters for correct information extraction. Think about, you know, medical, the medical field. In the medical field, there is a lot of facts that are negated, and we want to extract those correctly. Okay? That, that's where it's very, very important to not take something to be a fact when it's actually not a fact, right? And we don't have yet a good handle on it from a computational perspective, as well as, you know, linguists still have some work to do to get, you know, all those factors right also. As I show you, the rules go so far, but they do not capture everything. And current neural models are not capable of processing language the way humans do, though they are, they are pretty fascinating, right? And so if we look at the... Um, the Microsoft blog, actually at the end, you know, it was saying like, moving forward, it is worth exploring how to make the Berta um, incorporate compositional structure in a more explicit manner, which could allow combining neural and symbolic computation of natural language similar to what humans do. And so, you know, I had this question mark at the beginning of the talk, and I think that's where we are going, actually, trying to bridge the two. If you remember the um, quick, NLP history, we started with symbolic, we got to neural at the end, and now it's time to kind of combine both. Probably also with actually embodiment, right? And we start also doing that, having kind of robots that act in the world, because at the end of the day, if you have kids, you know that what matters for them to emerge to language is joint attention, right? And we always do pointing when they are very small, right? And when you read, you also point and you say, oh, look, the bunny, and you show the bunny on the image, right? You just don't say like, oh, a computer, not looking at the computer, right? Oh, a piano, of course, we have to ground it, right? And probably if we want machine to be like us, that's what we'll need to, uh, to do. But I cannot end this talk without, um, telling you about also the, the kind of bias that exists in those neural networks built on, on language. And so those are really double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, they are a, capable of you know, incredible pattern uh, discoveries. Some of the patterns that we saw you know, in the data, actually ling linguists didn't have those that detail. And so we do get some of that, but then also they amplify and replicate potential bias that exists in the data. And, and that's where I think, you know, we need to be aware of that as researcher and also try to minimize the problem of bias um, amplification. So let me show you some examples. So if you ask Google Translate, and you can try on your phone to translate the teacher in French, it translated to l'enseignant. And I'm sorry, you know, Google knows that French is interestingly uh, gender, right? So I think it could, and it has a big morphological dictionary, so it could say l'enseignant, l'enseignante. If you ask it to do the nurse, then it's l'infirmière, right? 
But of course, you know, that's what's in the data, right? Most of the data coming from the 70s, that's what it is, right? At that point, you had more male professor than female and vice versa for nurse. But you can also ask it to translate the beautiful teacher. What do you think it does? Female, the smart teacher. You can try, you can try on your phone. <laughs> Unless Google is listening, they will not fix it uh, quickly enough. And then another one, this is coming from Schwemmer et al. 2020 for vision. So you, you want to tag images with words. And um, if you look, so um, the man on the right, even though there is the American flag, right, is a spokesperson with 82% chance, an official for, with 88%, but the woman, you know, she's probably a television presenter, we talk about her hair, you know, a smile. But again, that's what's in the data, right? And maybe one of the things that's nice, you know, to see the positive is that we can find then that bias that exists, okay? Because in a way, we are, we are full of implicit bias when you think about it, right? Um, but we need to just be aware of, of that. And so since this is uh, organized by a physicist, I thought I would end with you know, a Stephen Hawking um, quote that I really like. We are not going to stop making progress or reverse it, so we must recognize the danger and control them. I'm an optimist, and I believe we can, and I do really uh, adhere to, uh, to that quote. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions...